Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings to the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to one of the more infamous poems of Leaves of Grass, The Dalliance of the Eagles, poem number 11 of the 29 poems of By the Roadside. Now, I say this is one of the most controversial poems uh, because it was believed to need needed to be a, a, a banned because of its obscenity. The Boston publisher uh, James R. Osgood in 1882 uh, was going to publish Leaves of Grass, but he said, you got to remove this one for it, its violation of, quote, the public statutes concerning obscene literature. Also banned was A Woman Waste for Me and Spontaneous Me, both poems that we've already commented on as being somewhat controversial. Now, our assumptions are that you have uh, been working with us at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, and that you've been with us from the very beginning, from inscriptions all the way up through and including a set of introductory comments for Roadside, and then uh, we just finished with Rich Givers. Now, if you've been following our, our uh, every poem, and this is why I've argued you guys, it's so much better to read all of Leaves of Grass, and, 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 and you know, there's different ways to do it. We've, we've read it in order. I think that's a fun way to do it as well. Because people who maybe uh, would, would pick out this poem might be somewhat shocked or whatever by this poem. But we will have seen lines that are far more radical than the ones that we are about to read right here. Now let's turn to our uh, Norcas really quickly and get a little bit of background information. This poem was first printed in Cope's Tobacco Plant, <laughs> a, a, a magazine, for November 1880. And is one of the new poems of Leaves of Grass of 1881. The Barrett manuscript shows much reworking, according to Clara Barris. Whitman, who had never witnessed the mating of eagles, wrote the poem from a description given him by John Burroughs, of all people, who observed the occurrence in the early 1860s at Marlboro on the Hudson River. And I would uh, challenge you, if you have not watched a YouTube video of the dalliance of eagles, that is to say, of eagles copulating, it's quite a remarkable thing. And Go back to my lecture that I've given to you on LearnStrong.net over um, Andrew Marvel's to his coy mistress, and I am going to argue that that 1681 poem stands behind this very poem in some profound ways. The way the poem ends is, Now therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow chapped power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our son stand still, yet we will make him run. I am convinced that that set of lines is what turned this poem into the powerful sexual reading that it, it was. I've had students that read this and they're like, I don't understand why everybody's getting upset. Basically what Whitman is doing is celebrating how eagles copulate, where they will fly high up into the air and they will slam together and because of course of the violent action of copulation, this can be a pretty violent activity, they cannot fly, they fall as one and then right before they, they hit the ground they will separate. Now for those who have been able to witness this, like John Burroughs, it is one of the most majestic things to see and of course we live out here where there's lots of eagles and so periodically if you're out on the on the hill you get to see something like this and it's always awe-inspiring when you see it. As I said, if you haven't if you haven't seen it, you need to YouTube it real quickly just so you know what we're talking about. So we're going to have now the dalliance of the eagle. I think the other thing that's compelling, dalliance obviously of or related to amorous sexual play, um, to attribute to animals this kind of activity is going to be one of the metaphoric readings of the play, uh, of the poem obviously. Um, but I also think that standing behind this, and for Whitman's audience, they would have known something like the following. The eagle, the bald eagle, not originally the bald, the bald eagle, the smaller eagle originally, but the, the eagle, the bald eagle, became the national bird in 1782. Of course, Clarence Thompson will um, help to make that on our seal and everything. And there's a whole legend about Ben Franklin not being very pleased with that as its selection. We know that Teddy Roosevelt also had some problems as opposed to maybe a bear or something as, as the national symbol. But Franklin was once recorded to have said that, that the uh, bald eagle was, quote, a bird of bad moral character, end quote. And I think it's possible that Whitman is playing that game as he writes this little poem, The Dalliance of the Eagles. Um, and this is the way he says it. Skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest, skyward, in air a sudden muffled sound, 
the dalliance of the eagles, the rushing amorous contact high in space together, the clinching interlocked claws, a living, fierce, gyrating wheel, four beating wings, two beaks, a swirling mass, tight grappling and tumbling, turning, clustering loops, straight downward falling, till over the river poised, the twain yet one, a moment's lull, a motionless, still balance in the air, then parting, talons loosening, upward again on slow firm pinion, slanting their separate diverse flight, she, hers, he, his, pursuing. Let's uh, point out that of the ten lines of this poem, fifteen different present participles to give that sense of movement, that powerful action. And of course, much has been made as well of the brilliant rhythm of this poem. It's a fun poem to read out loud. I challenge you to, of course, take your walk and, 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 and to go and, and read the poem out loud yourself. Notice the first word, skirting. It's a funny word, right? Because, of course, skirts have to do with, with female garb. And right away, people saw, and I, guys, I've said this to you, I think Whitman's having so much fun writing these poems in Leaves of Grass. I think there's a smile on his face all the way through. And I think he knew exactly what he was doing with a verb like skirting. Skirting the river road, my forenoon walk, my rest, and immediately we think, of course, of, uh, of Thoreau and, and the walks that he loved to take, even with Emerson. Skyward, in air, a sudden, muffled sound. Now, the, of course, the sudden will, will give a sense of, uh, of, like, immediacy, and then the word muffled with sound, the dalliance of the eagles. Now, of course, to dally, to dilly dally, to dally will have its sexual rendering, and here obviously the dalliance of the eagles will mean the copulation of eagles, okay? So right away, yeah, there might be some people who are offended, but it is only because they perceive that what Whitman is actually doing is writing something that is figurative or metaphoric. In other words, eagles come together and they have this, this kind of really powerful emotional sexual experience. Is he talking about eagles or is he talking about two strangers, for example, walking the streets, uh, the streets of New York? The rushing Amorous contact, by the way, this word amorous will come back as echoes from Song of Myself 22, right? Dash me with amorous wet. So we've seen his use of this word in controversial ways. Amorous contact, high in space together. And notice we start with together and we end separated. The clinching interlocking clause. And I told you guys when we started our study of Song of Myself that this idea of holding, of grabbing, of hugging, here it's clenching, by the way, the only use of that word in all of these grass is right here, clenching, interlocking claws, and then notice a living, fierce, gyrating wheel. Now this, uh, this idea of ferocity, the fierceness, and there's such action in Lisa Grass in so many lines and so many words. Here, the gyrating wheel makes us think about Yeats' uh, of course sailing to Byzantium, Osages standing in God's holy fire, as in a gold mosaic of a wall, come from the holy world, wrote, burn in a gyre, that idea of the gyre, and of course second coming we have this turning gyre, so we have that, that game being played. You'll remember that in Song of Myself, passage 48, that he said, no object is so soft, but that it becomes a hub for the wheeled universe, and I think Whitman is playing around with some of those same kind of images. And then he describes literally what's happening. And again, if you haven't seen it, go and look at it on a YouTube video. It's quite a compelling thing. As eagles will lock together, four beating wings, two beaks, a swirling mass, tight grappling. And from clenching, we go to grappling. He'll use the word grappling one other time in Long Too Long America. In Notice all the T sounds, the tumbling, turning, clustering, again, all these present participles that give this sense of, you're literally watching this loops. And again, think about the way in which reading Leaves of Grass is from Song of Myself, Passage 6 and on. So much about the looping, the circling, the cycling of so many different types of phenomena of nature. Straight, downward, falling. And this is, of course, what eagles will do when they copulate, because obviously they can't fly when, they're, when they are together. Till, back to more T sounds, over the river, we're back to the opening line of River Road, poised the twain yet one, a moment's lull, and again, it's almost like suspended in time. The brilliance of the language of this poem, it's like almost suspended in time. You can see that they're falling, but then it's almost like a motionless, still balance in the air. Now, when we get to Roaming and Thought, the next poem, the subtitle is going to be after reading Hegel. And I think that there is some Hegelian philosophy going on here. I think it is the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis project that's being played out here. In other words, for a single moment, two become one, 
a motionless still balance in the air. And of course, balance has been one of those great ideas of Leaves of Grass. Then, the party. We go from claws to talons, loosening, upward again on slow, and then of course the word firm. We'll have all kinds of sexual renderings. Per, firm pinions, slanting. They're separate, no longer together. Diverse flight. She, hers, he, his. And then the final word is the word pursuing. Now I think that that word is the key word of the entire poem. Now the, of course, no question, at 2A, the poem can be read as an idea or a discussion of the power of the art of nature. Nature's art is always the best art. Certainly we could make that argument as we study it. Somebody like Burroughs is going to make the argument to Whitman. There are things that one can witness, bird life or in any number of different animals' lives in nature, that's so compelling it blows our minds. But it's clear it to be, and that's where we have to go to read a poem like this. There's a reason why any number of people wanted this poem to be banned. They saw it as obscene. They saw it as even, we might say, pornographic. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that standing behind this poem is Andrew Marvel's To His Coy Mistress, and the idea of let us sport us while we may, of birds of am uh, uh, amorous birds of prey and all of that. The idea here is that we're playing around with a word picture or with a metaphor or figurative language to speak about human sexuality, especially human sexuality that will come together for a brief few moments and then will separate and off they go in their separate directions. In other words, we really have a hookup poem here. Long before it was ever called a hookup poem, we have a hookup poem here. And, of course, some of you are smiling even as we say this because this is what Leaves of Grass does. It will play with, it will play with language on so many different levels that you're not exactly sure ex how you're supposed to take a poem like this. Um, I've already mentioned it to be as well that in 10 lines you get 15 different present participles, which is quite a compelling, compelling uh, reading of the poem. And of course, we go from movement, I was walking by the river, to this uh, radical thing that's happening, and then the stillness of the moment, and then the separation, and then more movement. It's, it's quite a remarkable poem. It's very Hegelian in its construction at that. I want to remind you at 3A that um, Whitman writes that poem in Song of Myself 32, which was a very controversial one about, I think I could turn and live with the animals. And one of the things he says is that animals don't engage in this level of guilt play that is such a part of the human condition. And of course, Whitman is going to make observations throughout Leaves of Grass about how sexuality has become, for so many of his readers, this thing you're not supposed to talk about, this taboo. And yet Whitman is going to pick it up, as we said, of course, in Song of Myself Passage 5 and any number of other places. And here, he could easily stand behind the, what are you talking about? I was just describing the, ma the majestic copulation of two eagles. Um, and of course, others are going to say, no, no, we know exactly the game that you're playing. How dare you? I also, at 3A, uh, here want to connect this poem with uh, pr uh, prose and uh, remembrance of things past. The, the game he plays there is the same game that Whitman will play several times in Leaves of Grass. I also want to just mention a poem that we've given full exegesis of elsewhere at lunchdrawing.net, Tennyson's Eagle, he clasps uh, the Craig with crooked hands. Um, the idea of, of the majestic nature of this bird and the power to equate language to describe the bird as he falls, as he, as he sits above the wrinkled sea um, of, of Tennyson's poem. I think Tennyson's eagle had something to do with, uh, with the appreciation of wildlife and, of course, the eagle that Whitman is playing with here. Finally, at 3B, this will be maybe a little bit different type of question. Of what are your thoughts about this poem? How do you read this poem? Do you read this as simply the celebration of an act in nature that's so compelling? Or do you read this poem as actually Whitman's game that he's playing with uh, human sexuality and the ways in which human sexuality um, can be described in remarkable ways, remarkable ways. Standing behind this poem is actually something far more powerful going on. Of course, much has been made by scholars about Whitman and his own sexual life. Was he, um, was he asexual? Was he um, uh, predominantly engaged in homoeroticism? Was he, a, was he a homosexual and engaged in that kind of activity? It's, it's, all, it's always going to be a subject of debate when you pick up leaves of grass. As I said, I think Whitman is smiling the whole way. Now, for the last of the poems, of By the Roadside. I already mentioned the Hegelian poem to come. They're really, really brief poems, and we're going to see this is the last quote-unquote true poem of By the Roadside. And then we get all these kind of almost like looks, poetic askance poems, where just kind of a thought, and a brief, a brief um, kind of interlude, a, a little brief speculation, and then we're on to the next poem. The poem will read, uh, the, the uh, section By the Roadside will read, interestingly, the way these two 
eagles that are connected are going to fall and then separate. The poem will have this sense of like a stillness in movement that we will uh, that we will enjoy as we then finish our reading of By the Roadside as we're obviously getting ready for drum taps. Thank you.